Hello, my name is Elliot Ash. I am Assistant Professor of Law, Economics, and Data Science at ETH Zurich. I'm from the US. I grew up in Texas, uh, outside of Houston. Today, I'll talk to you about my research at the intersection of law and data science. Outside of work, I spend my time with my wife, Holly, and my two-year-old twins, Aiden and Imogen. Uh, we like to take them to the zoo and hiking on Zurich Berg and Adlisberg. My research is at the intersection of the three fields, law, economics, and data science. First, the substantive focus is on law and the legal system. This includes lawmakers, politicians, legislators who make the laws, as well as the police and the judges who enforce the law. And then finally, the potential criminals, the potential defendants, the potential litigants who might decide to break the law. Second, Economics is the social science framework that our work comes from. So a focus in economics is on incentives. And so people respond to costs and benefits. And the law itself can be seen as a broad set of incentives that shape society. So when people are deciding whether to commit crimes, whether to steal or murder, when people are deciding whether to renege on contracts, whether to uh, get in car accidents or drive too fast. All of these are decisions that are shaped by legal incentives. We have to think ahead, will I be arrested for this? Will I be sued for this? And this really shapes our society and our culture. Therefore, taking an economic or incentives approach to the law and to society can produce many fruitful insights. In turn, the public officials who are part of the legal system, the lawmakers and the judges and the police, they are also actors who respond to incentives. So for example, if we want judges to be harsher on crime, uh, we can try to reward them for that. If we want politicians to do the bidding of voters, uh, we can increase democratic incentives. Third, data science refers to the statistical and computational tools that we use to undertake this social science analysis. This includes, first, natural language processing, which is needed to read the thousands or millions of legal documents that we might want to analyze. This could include legislation or contracts or judicial opinions, perhaps even the speeches of judges, the speeches of politicians. Natural language processing or NLP tools can be used to analyze those documents quantitatively. Second, we use machine learning tools. These are important tools from artificial intelligence which allow us to analyze high dimensional data sets. The standard statistical tools that you would have learned in Stats 101 or in Econometrics do not work well on these high dimensional data sets. In particular, we can use machine learning to predict the outcomes of a judge's decision to try to help them make better decisions. Finally, as, and this is part of my background in economics, we put a strong emphasis on causal inference. This is the idea that we want to get at causal relations between actions and entities, and not just correlations. That way, when we get these causal relations, that will be most useful for policymakers who want to pass policies based on our research. So how are we using AI in our research? First, we use machine learning to support better decisions. An example I wanted to tell you about is a project on the municipalities of Brazil. So in Brazil, there is an audit process where a selection of municipalities are selected each year and audited for corruption. This corruption is located in their budgets, in their fiscal accounts. It turns out that a machine learning model that is trained on these budget accounts can detect corruption. So in our research, we can show that using the fiscal accounts data, combined with the information from the audits, we can then produce a risk score or a predicted probability of corruption for all municipalities in Brazil. Moving back to the courts, my team also used machine learning algorithms to predict the subsequent criminal actions of defendants. So this is quite important in a judicial decision process where judges have to decide, should I give bail? Should I give parole? Should I give probation? When defendants, when they get back on the street, they might commit more crimes. It turns out that machine learning tools can be applied to the characteristics of these defendants 
to predict whether they will commit more crimes in the future. That is, what is their risk of recidivism? Then we can use these metrics to analyze fairness and consistency across judges. Because we have this risk score for the probability that a criminal will commit more crimes, we can ask whether judges treat defendants of the same risk level. We can ask if they treat them differently based on their background attributes, such as ethnicity and age. We can then analyze these biases as an outcome in a social science framework and ask, are these biases the result of different cultural or political processes, such as being up for election? Second, we use AI to produce measurements from texts. So we commonly use data sets with thousands, tens of thousands, even millions of documents, such as all of the court cases published in the United States, all of the court decisions published in India, all of the speeches made by congressmen in the US Congress, you wouldn't be able to read all of these. So instead, we have computers read through these documents and extract relevant information. For example, we use a natural language processing tool to measure the emotional intensity of speeches in Congress using 9 million speeches starting from the 1800s. What we find is that in the early parts of the period, the congressmen were pretty logical and deliberative and reasoned. They didn't use a lot of emotional expression in their speeches. Starting around the late 1970s, congressmen were on a very strong upward trajectory in emotional expression. And we went back in time to figure out what was going on at this time. It turns out it's when congressional sessions started being televised. So when congressmen are put on TV, there must be some rewards to getting, making emotional appeals to voters. There are many areas where the decisions of public officials don't live up to the high standards that we put in place for them. Take the case of judges. We do put them on a pedestal. We do say they, they wear robes. <laughs> They're, they have this very special place in society. But they're human beings. And so they don't have infinite time. They don't have infinite energy. And they will make mistakes. And I think that is one of the areas of promise of artificial intelligence tools, is to give judges more information about the cases they're deciding. In a given case, the AI provides some recommendations about the right decision, as well as pointing to the relevant factors and evidence that should be useful for the decision. We can think of the machine as a conscience on a judge's shoulder, reminding them about the legally relevant factors. So far, I've talked about how AI can be used to search through documents and extract information. But something that's more experimental, more cutting edge, is that artificial intelligence can actually produce new language. It can write new texts. In the case of law, for example, we can imagine artificial intelligence is writing the first draft of contracts, or potentially writing the first arguments that judges use to write their opinions. In my own group's research, we've trained a artificial intelligence model to produce legal text. It turns out this is quite believable. If you just read a paragraph that our AI writes, you probably wouldn't be able to tell if it was, written from a, it was taken from a real human written case or uh, from a machine generated case. So far, I've mostly talked about the significant payoffs from joining AI technology with the law to produce legal tech. But there also are some significant risks and problems that we should be aware of, not just as researchers, but also as practitioners and policymakers. In particular, I mentioned that when you bring in an AI to support judge decision making, they can point the judge toward the more consistent decision, the decision that previous judges have made. But the problem is, if you teach an AI to replicate the decisions of a human judge, if those human judgments were biased in the aggregate, uh, for example, uh, biased towards people of different ethnicities, of different ages, other disadvantaged minorities, the machine decision maker will replicate the biases of the human decision maker that it was trained to replicate. This is a, a big problem, and there's also a risk that the human decision biases could be amplified uh, by the machine biases. Thus, the algorithms themselves should be consulted for bias. 
I've discussed previously how AI tools can be used to detect bias among human judges, but they can also be used to interrogate biases in the AI decision systems themselves. Fortunately, there is an emerging and exciting area of research in AI fairness. So this includes, for example, explainable AI, where we can look into the peer, where we can peer into the black box of an AI model and ask, what is driving the decision? So if we, if we use this model and find out that the AI is using uh, sensitive characteristics such as ethnicity, we would know that there was a problem and it should be resolved. Machines are already better at lawyers in some tasks. For example, you know, doing a search, running a search through many documents. And we can imagine this disparity becoming even more extreme over time. And at some point, lawyers will be using AIs to support their work on a daily basis. In 2040, every individual will have access to expert legal services instantly through their smartphone, through an AI lawyer. In turn, lawyers will have access to AI in their, in their own work. So, you know, human lawyers won't be completely replaced by AI. There will be many cases where human decision making is needed, but it will be part of their everyday life to have machine learning, natural language processing, artificial intelligence tools supporting them in their work. To get to this future in 2040, many things will have to change along the way. We will need many changes in how AI is used in practice to make sure that we understand how these predictions are made. We will need many systems in place to produce trust in AI-supported legal decision-making. This includes robust explanations that even non-lawyers can understand, and transparency, for example, with the code base, with the data sets, and other factors to make sure that a democratic process is used to build these systems. What will this mean for society? I think at a deep level, this is going to make us question what it is to be human. I think that up until recently, if you said having a concept of justice is part of being human, no one would disagree with that. But I think what we're seeing with, at, in this new area of legal tech is that artificial intelligence is complementary with human intelligence in seeking justice. So it's going to change our concept of what it means to be human.